All right, everyone. So at this point, we were going through the list and applying these items directly to a blog post, crafting this blog post. So um, we were going to look at, um, I'm going to jump over here to, I'm going to jump to headings, number six. So take advantage of headings. They are used for breaking up a wall of text into readable sections and it helps the search engine understand your content. So I've, uh, I've got the more button right there. You can press enter and then it goes to the next line. Now what I want to do is think about what one or two, maybe three ways can I divide up my content. If I've got a hundred words, I can still divide it into maybe one section or two sections. For example, in mine, mine is the recipe of the month. So I'm sort of thinking I can have definitely a section where the recipe is at. So let's say I'm going to have history and then a bunch of history stuff and then recipe and then the recipe. So this is going to divide the history section from the rest and this is going to divide the recipe section from the rest but it's not just good enough for me to to change it like that and then and then add bold don't do that you want to write your text your dividing text and then change this from paragraph to one of these headings that's what they're there for to divide to change the text larger to give it meaning and my advice is don't use heading one heading one actually automatically gets oftentimes used by your title here. Your title is going to appear on screen and WordPress by default often uses heading 1 for it. And then if you run an SEO check it's gonna say error multiple heading 1 tags even though you would think well I only added it to this one. Assume that your title has already been set to heading 1. So I usually start then I'm gonna select history turn it into heading 2 and then now that's big and bold and important looking. More importantly, it's dividing up my content into this section and that section. What's that? Well, that little drop down box, yep, yeah, where it says. Well, again, if you don't see that, you'll have to turn on the option at the very end here toggle toolbar. Well, the biggest thing about it is, you know, individually between level one and two and so forth, there's no big deal about using those via SEO. The big deal is to use them. If you've not used them, you might be hurting yourself. If you do use any of the headings, you're helping yourself. Better yet, you're using them in the intended order of meaning. Heading one's already used, because it's going to be the big old title there. That's done. Heading two. I've got recipe. I could set that one to heading three, or I could also set it to heading two, and that would be fine. Because that heading two, both of those, are dividing up a particular section they both have a, an importance, they're both second most important. This is a section of history, this is a section of recipe, like chapters. I've got ten chapters, each of them is as important as the last. But what I could do here under recipe, I could have here ingredients, list ingredients, and then prep, and list prep. And then here I could set these to H3, heading 3. So now I've got this, the bigger section of recipe, which is heading two, and then I've got the smaller sections. Maybe the text looks larger, but just because it's more text. But meaning, in the terms of meaning, it is, it is, you know, it's it's a lower level, a heading three as opposed to a heading two as opposed to a heading one. So if we use headings, it's going to help our SEO. Which one to use? You use it as appropriate. And as long as you use any of the headings, you're helping your SEO. If I wanted on the heading two line to add an image, like a small clip art or something, something um, 
Well, when we talk about images, we can get in detail, but the short answer is if you click next to the heading and then add media, that's where you can select a picture. And then your picture should go to the left of it. I would recommend, though, probably keep the history on its own line and put the picture next to the actual paragraph. Because if that picture relates to the history, and now you've usurped the meaning of that heading by putting a picture first, it's a bit confusing. So keep the heading to there first, and then on the next line put the picture so that it's next to the text. Would it automatically size it so it's not as large as the picture, let's say, that we use at the very top? Like not, um, not automatically, how you might think, but WordPress does have defaults in that you put in a big picture and it'll give you the option, small, medium, large, thumbnail. Okay. So usually, I believe it chooses medium. But medium could be a certain size on one theme and medium could be a larger size on another theme. So here I'm adhering to item number six, headings. Uh, obviously, off the top of my head, this, this obviously makes sense. You will have to figure out what makes sense for your content. But in my particular post, I'm, I'm going to be writing a history of this particular cupcake, and then I'm going to give the recipe. And then I could then further subdivide that into the ingredients and the prep. I'm not going to add too much here, just a little content. Um, I have uh, lists on number seven. In my case, it makes sense to use lists. Uh, you don't have to do every one of these things for every one of your blog posts. Use them as necessary. For example, lists. You might not need to make a list of, of, of your items. In mine, obviously I do because I've got recipe, I've got ingredients. So what would work great here is a bullet point list. So I would say eggs, uh, flour, chocolate chips, etc., etc. To make the bullet points, you type, you type them, select them, and then you have the option right here, bulleted list. Bulleted lips, lists help you for your organization so that users can digest your content. And again, organization, the search engines like that also, and that helps your SEO if you are organized. So now when I add the next item, it automatically adds a bullet point, just like Word. In my case, I also need a numbered list. Here we have numbered list in prep. I would say um, beat eggs till frothy, fold in flour, chop saffron, and mix in. And this needs to be done in this order. If I do it in another order, it will fail. So in this case, this is why I would use the numbered list. It creates this order. Do this first, do this second, do this third. So I wouldn't want to add the saffron before I beat the eggs. Again, depending on what you're writing, you may want to use bullet points or numbered list as necessary, but you don't have to 
force it into your post if it's not necessary. This should, uh, this should automatically save itself. WordPress does auto-save. Uh, sometimes I feel it's not so consistent, however. Sometimes I, I see on the top right over here that it said when it last auto-saved. Mine doesn't seem to say. Does anyone see any, any mention on the top right of auto-save on yours? No, so I, I would be safe clicking Save Draft. I would feel better, that is, clicking Save Draft. Do you have a publish button? No. Does it say update? Yes. You've already published it instead of uh, saved it. Okay, so I've got read more, li uh, list. Okay, links. We can talk about links. Um, th again, this is about the the phishing. So this is how I would do this. And this perhaps you can incorporate this step throughout your writing process, either throughout the writing process or at the end of the writing process. The point is I want to figure out what other blogs I can link to, external sites that I can link to because I'm going to be phishing. I'm going to be casting these lures to try to get bytes, to try to get backlinks. So that means I'm going to open another window and then I'm going to search for cookie recipe. I'm going to search for something related to my blog post. It could be the exact thing, but in a sense, why would I link to someone else's cookie recipe, chocolate chip cookie recipe? I'm, I'm saying mine's the best. So I'm going to link to someone else's maybe pecan cookie recipe. I'm going to browse the results and I'm going to then kind of see which would be a good link to because honestly I would love to get a link back from the Food Network to my blog but I don't think they're going to see me ever. They've got their number one, their, they don't need to link to anyone else, they get all the traffic. I'm going to search for something and I'm going to look at the little guys. Or I'm going to look for the little guys. I'm going to look for bloggers perhaps on my level, a couple levels ahead, not 10 levels ahead like Food Network. So let's see this one, Taste of Home. I don't think I've heard of them. I'm going to click them. I'm going to see what they're about. I don't know if I really want to link to them. They feel overall like a spammy kind of site, especially with the very appetizing spider picture right there. But the point here is that this might not be as direct as you think. You're going to need to browse. You're going to need to um, maybe go to page two or whatever. You're going to need to look up other people's Uh, other people's sites and, and hopefully smaller companies or, or brands or whatever. Here's brown, browneyedbaker.com, Pecan Sandies. Let's see that one. Press enter two times. All right, I'll check in one moment. So I found over here perhaps this one might be useful. It's got responses. People are commenting on it. That's good. What I can do is then this particular other person's blog, what I can do is copy that link. I'm going to go up to their address and copy it. And I'm going to figure out how can I incorporate this link into my post in a way that is natural, in a way that's organic, not that's just a bullet-pointed list of links. So this is a pecan sandy recipe. Back on mine. Maybe I could have an 
at the end, conclusion, and we could write um, A unique recipe will surely tickle your taste buds. And the types of cookies. Pecan Sandies are our second choice. And then within that, I'm going to make the word Pecan Sandies right there. I'm, I'm going to make that an active link so you can select your text and then up at the top menu bar here, you have a little chain to insert a link. And that address that I copied from that other blog, I will paste. So now the text within my blog, Pecan Sandy, will become an active link to some other site. The point of that is perhaps that site, once they get their notification, comes to my site, reads some of my blog posts, sees what I'm about, and maybe they will link back to our site. My note here also mentions about links for external. When setting external links, remember to make them open in their own tab, which is this option right here. You want to make a note, make your links open in another tab. Make someone else's links open in another tab. Because what could happen is, if I don't turn that on, someone clicks that link and goes to their website, browneyedbaker.com, they're finished looking at that site and they close it, they closed my site too. But if I select to open in a new window or tab, they go look at their site for a while, they close their tab, and my tab is still up at the top. They don't lose my site. So when you're inserting this link, remember to Turn on open link in a new window or tab when you are linking to someone else's site. In a moment when we do an internal link, um, you won't need to do that. You don't need a new window, a new pop-up for your own site. That's weird. You're going to be opening up all of these windows navigating in your own site. That's going to confuse people, maybe upset them, maybe they'll close all the windows and not come back to your site. You only want to turn this on when you visit someone else's site. When you want to add link, and now that has a link there. Once I publish, the two sites will communicate with each other. That's what those trackbacks and pingbacks and all of that stuff is. Our site will send a message basically over to the other site. The webmasters there will see within their dashboard, here's a new link, and then they can ignore it, they can look at my site, Maybe then they will write some blog post or do something that links back to our site and I could get traffic from them. Obviously that's easier said than done, but in the SEO class we would go into more detail about creating content that you would get links back for. The point is that you want to think about adding one external link if it's necessary or relevant, that is, per post. That's how you reach out to other people's sites so you can get traffic from them back to yours. At the very top, you have the button right there for the link. That's the one you click on. Mm -hmm. Yep, the one I said. Well, if you put your mouse on it, it says remove link. Yep. Now, if I go back to the browneyedbaker.com and I saw their recipe, 
and I see it seems to have a lot of activity, 43 comments. There's nothing to stop me from me also adding my own comment, unless they turned it off. Uh, nope, there is a spot right there. So maybe it's not as obvious in my handout here. I should, under promoting, maybe on version 2 of this, under promoting I should have a number 5. I've got guest blogging, which is that you go and write a blog post for someone. I should write for number 5, guest commenting, which is if you go to someone's site related to your stuff and they have the ability to comment, take advantage of that. You write something here. Look at how these people are writing, you know, not just like, I agree, or nice job. They're writing something a little bit more. They were delicious, and my son, who is already a chocoholic at his young age, loved them too. Thanks for sharing. Okay, they're writing something meaningful. They're creating a community. You need to do that. Because Kate Crossland right here, um, if, she, if she filled in her website, a link back to her website would be active. A link back to your website would be active. So if you comment on people's blogs, oftentimes they're like this. Put in a name, put in an email, put in a website, which is optional, and put in your comment. I recommend put in your website, this blog, because then you will have an active link from that other person's site back to your site. In a sense, it's a kind of a backlink that you are writing on their site back to your site. That can, of course, be abused, but I know you guys would never do that. You would be writing legitimate comments, relevant comments. Notice this, it says pingback. This is a link. This is what I'm saying. They get the notification there's a link. So there's a link from a Pinterest board. 157 Christmas cookies and holiday recipes. So if you linked over to them, like I'm about to, that will then populate saying pingback, and it'll have my site there. So when someone reads the, reads, browses these comments, they will see your site there, right there, pingback, chile con queso recipe. Uh, that's an internal link. Is it back It's sort of like the technical term for what it is. But yeah, you can think of them as the same thing. So you can think of them as sort of the same thing, yeah. So that would be for my version 2 of this handout, number 5, guest commenting. Go to other people's sites, add a comment, make sure, like this one, I, I just love my apron. That one has their site filled in, so when you click it, it takes them back to their blog spot. So I just gave them some traffic. These that don't have their name underlined, they didn't add a URL because, you know, they don't have an address. But then right here, Jen, how to simplify, Lauren, Daydreamer Desserts, these other bloggers have commented on this blog, and now they're getting free traffic, in theory, back to their site. Okay, but they're on the, when you go and write the, the comment on the, on, with your guest on the other, other blog, and you get a ping back, was that an automatic ping, or did the, did the person act, person read the comment and, and respond to it? What, what caused the ping back? Was it, was it automatic? Ping back? Can, you, can you say that first part again? Um, okay, so we're talking about you go to um, your, your, your guest commenting, you write in your, your relevant, legitimate comments, and then all of a sudden you got a ping back on your website because mm -hmm. you went there. But what caused the ping back? Did it, was it an automatic thing or did somebody, did you get the ping back because somebody responded? Well, these that are showing up here is because someone made a link to their site, so yeah, it's basically automatic. If they linked to your site, you will get the ping back. It's automatic. It's built into the whole WordPress system. Okay. But the Word, WordPress does it then? Yeah. WordPress does the ping back. They don't have to do anything. They don't have to do anything to get a ping back. Well, they have to do the link. Oh, they have to do the link. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm.
All right, back to writing here. Um, that was an external link. I linked over to someone else's site uh, as necessary. Also, speaking of links, you should have internal links. So wherever within your content in an organic way, meaning in a way that doesn't seem forced, perhaps somewhere also link to some of your other content within your own post, within your own blog. So, um, like I've got that pecan sandy right there, I could also say, um, I guess this is about cupcakes, why did I say cookies? It's late. But uh, I could say um, also, if chocolate, isn't your favorite, you also have, or you might also like our uh, marzipan. And then that I could link. You might also like our marzipan. That could be an internal link. I might have a blog post about that. So it's kind of the same way. I would select the text, click the link, and now we've got, instead of linking to someone else's site, we have the option here, or link to existing content. If I already had my other posts and such, they would show up here. I don't have anything to show, to link to, so it's not, it's not going to quite work. But you see that if you're going to link to your own content, it's going to be inside of the link to existing content. The point of that is that then, uh, again, you have them going from one post to another post of your own site, keeping them on your site, capturing them there, so that they can subscribe to your blog, so they can buy your book, so that they can register for your newsletter, whatever it is you want them to do on your site. So you can type a word or a heading in that search box? This, um, this is only going to let you search for the title of a post or a page. It won't, it won't unfortunately, it will not search inside of the post. So right now there's only hello world and about. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to add other, you know, tabs, I don't know what they're called. Is that what categories are? What we were looking at in this screen was a list of all of our pages or posts. Pages, okay. So if you wanted to add a page, then we'll get something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, products or something. Products. Well. This assumes here it already exists. We cannot create a page or a post in this screen. We can only select one. Okay. So, so I have to go somewhere else to add that page. Yes. Would... Yeah, you would go over to the pages and add a new page or add a new post. So yes, this screen assumes you've already got a link to link to, a page or a post to link to. You cannot create one at this screen. So then let's say that that link is an internal link that linked over from um, this post to another post. And uh, again, that's, that's relevant, that's useful to link from page to page. But you say, well, I already activated that related posts option before. Why would I do this? This is redundant, possibly. That, um, that related posts um, option is going to work with your categories and such so it may not be showing the exact post that you want people to see after they read this post. And it's actually going to randomize itself from what I understand. It's not always going to show you the same four things at the bottom. So the reason we might want to have a direct link like that is because that link, we told it exactly this page. And therefore a person will be funneled to that particular 
post if they follow that link. And that's a big difference between doing it this way and just relying on the related posts. Related posts are going to change. They're going to randomize. This will link directly to a post that I want them to. Yes? So this is all helping with the SEO because if you've got somebody on your site and they're linking back within your site, then the search engines pick that up? Yes, believe it or not, uh, Google, for example, can keep track of how long a person stays on your site. Um, and even uh, if they just visited one page and left, they, they can follow the whole path of where one person went throughout your whole site. And then obviously if the search engine sees people are spending 10 minutes at a time on your site, your competitors are spending one minute. People are going through three different pages throughout your site. Your competitor, they just read one blog post and they leave. That's going to be showing the search engines your content is more relevant to people and therefore popularity breeds popularity. Your search engine rankings and such would increase in theory compared to your competitor. So that's why I want to keep them more often on my more longer on my site. We were going to look at that right now. Tags and categories. That's number nine, organization. Uh, if you look along the right side column, you should see a box of categories and a box of tags. So I believe we, when we were here last time, we created a couple tags and a couple of categories. So I'm using a different site. It's not listed here. But under categories, if you did create categories, they should be listed here. You just have to turn them on. And then if you think of, well, this is a new category that I haven't created yet, you can create one on this at this at this moment. Add new category, type it, and then click add new category. So now this particular post has been categorized under recipe. And I believe I said last time, do not use the uncategorized category. Um, that one is just a temporary placeholder. It's also the mark of an amateur. Um, it shows the search engines you don't know what you're doing. So don't use uncategorized. You want to create categories and turn on the categories. How many? I believe I mentioned it here. Does anyone remember how many categories? One to three. One to three is good for, for categories, but then tags are good three to five. So one to three categories, and then down here tags, three to five tags. If you've already written a few tags before and you click choose from latest, they should show up. And if they don't, you can add them here. So I will one of the one of the ingredients here was saffron. That's not big enough for a category, let's say. A category, we had the discussion last time, what's the big difference? The category is the big idea. All my recipes, all my cupcakes of the month, all my employee of the quarters. But then the tags are the specifics. Chocolate, which could be chocolate cookies, chocolate cakes, chocolate bunnies. Um, then we've got, like, like here, um, saffron. It's being used in this blog post about these cookies. It's being used in this post about that other cake, etc. So this is the organization I'm talking about in number nine. Use categories one to three and use tags three to five. If you want to remove a category, turn its checkbox off, but it will default back to uncategorized when you publish it. It needs always a category and if you don't choose one it'll be uncategorized tags, if you don't want to tag anymore, you can just click the little X. Why is it not good to have as many tags as you possibly can? It seems like you'd be casting a wider net. Well, unfortunately, that's part of the moving target of SEO. 
in the beginning, that was the best technique. Put as many tags and categories and such as you'd want. But then the spammers went overboard. The spammers put every word in the dictionary on every post, or 10 variations of the exact same tag or category. And then the search engine said, okay, it's being abused. Now let's rein it in. Let's look at only the top five tags or whatever. Uh, and if you use more than that, it might brand you as a spammer because the rules might be telling you one thing, you're going against the rules. It's a good idea to follow the rules, especially with search engines. Because unfortunately, the search engines really operate on, an, on the term of guilty until proven innocent. Instead of innocent until proven guilty. If you do things that mark you as a spammer, you're going to get marked as a spammer. And to get out of that, you're going to have to struggle to convince the search engines, I'm not a spammer. I just want to be clear, three to five category or just three to five tags? Three to five tags for the post. For the post. For the yes. Post. Mm -hmm. Is that the same thing as Instagram? I know that's not social media, but if you're on Instagram, you should put so many hashtags. Well, on in Instagram, I'm pretty sure that their limit is 30. So you can put up to 30 on one post. On one post. Mm -hmm. So on that one, I do kind of load it up with 10 or 15 or 20, depending. Relevant ones. Their maximum is 30 on Instagram. This was our organization. The point of this is when someone visits the site, and also, depending on your theme, when you publish this, those those um, categories and such show up. So, for example, back to this blog over here. At the end of this particular blog, I see that they used category investing tags, betterment, robo-advisor, and stock market. So those are the tags that they use. They use three tags. They used one category. So then if I want to know what more about robo-advisor, what is that? I click that and it shows me that there's this. Best investment, the true cost of robo-advisors, bloom review, better management of your 401k, personal capital review, so that's why we want to use categories. Let me see here at the brown-eyed baker. Um, most likely they've also got categories and tags. Posted in cookies. So they put it into the category of cookies. They might have the, uh, the tags uh, or might not. Uh, their category might be all that they really need but that's the organization. Yes? Is, um, I know this is in the SEO class, but is there some place uh, where there's a list of the most common tags or... I mean, because I can make up tags for my posts, but are there some that are going to rank higher in SEO or in the search engines? Well, that is definitely an answer for the SEO class because what we can do is look up keywords inside of Google, Google AdWords and, 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 and Bing Toolbox. We can do some keyword research there and it'll tell us these keywords are pretty active. These ones are not. So within the Webmaster Tools, it would tell us that. We could also do a search and, and look up best uh, bakery website keywords. We might be able to find some some help that way, although I I would be very careful doing it this way because anyone can make an opinion about what the best ones are. So uh, really the best is going to come from the search engines doing the research. There's, no, there's not going to be a list because again anyone can make up this list. So we've been checking off a bunch of these as we're going on. Uh, description, title, all of that stuff. Um, the last one to look at before our time is up here is uh, images. 
we haven't added any image to this document. I think you, you probably have an image in, in, your, in your media library. So let's say I'm going to add an image at the end of my, at my post here. You can click up at the top, Add Media. And then under Media Library, here would, would show a list of your current um, pictures up on your site. Let me upload one because I don't have one uploaded already. You probably already do. No, we don't. Did we do it here? Did we upload a picture? No. Well. Yeah, don't use those. Okay, so those, you find those are the sponsored ones, so don't use those. So let's say, okay, we're, we're in here, we don't have anything in the media library, so we can click Upload Files, click Select Files, We've got a few pictures, perhaps not the best one for you, but we'll work with what we have. We've got a few pictures if we look on the left side over here under Libraries, and then Pictures, My Pictures, Public Pictures? Hmm, maybe not. I don't see Sample Pictures. Oh, there they are. Sample, no. Well, Sample Pictures. Okay. So under the left side, Libraries, click on Pictures, and then you should see Sample Pictures. Open Sample Pictures, and just pick any one of those. Double click. So I have a picture, and what my note here says, choose images that relate. Use your own images. On a technical level, make sure your file names are meaningful. At the moment, this particular file name at the top here, koala.jpg, that's okay. It's way better than img142.jpg. You cannot edit this in WordPress. You have to edit it before you upload it. So you can't edit that. But now I know to to, to edit that before I upload. What I can do is the part that says on number five um, and that you've added alt text which is found right here, alt text. This is the text that the search engines want you to add to every picture that you upload. This is the description, one sentence that describes what that picture is. The point of this is that people that are blind visiting your website should also be able to navigate and use and enjoy your website. And so if there's a picture there, their computer will not be able to read what that thing is. It'll just say image. Maybe they have a computer that can perhaps understand that that's a koala, but perhaps that is your Carol the Koala mascot, and how would a computer ever know that? So with that alt text, that's what I would write. Carol the koala welcomes you. You can write something literal there. This is a picture of a koala. That's <coughs> fine. You can write something more descriptive, especially if it's like your product and such. And here, it's a picture of the koala, and I could write koala, but better, I'm writing Carol the koala welcomes you. And I'm satisfying the requirement that the search engines look for nowadays. Before it was a recommendation. Now basically they say, do this. Make sure you add alt text to your pictures. The other ones here are optional. The, the requirement is the alt text. Title is the text that appears when you hover your mouse over the picture, the little pop-up text. You could make that the same as the alt text, that's fine. Caption is the text that appears below the picture. That's optional, you don't have to make it show on screen. And then description is just for you. 
because you could have 20 pictures, 200 pictures saved in your WordPress and you've got the option to search for your pictures. So if you add a description you'll be able to find your pictures. The only requirement is the alt text. That's the one I recommend. You can do the other ones if you want. So I will insert into post. Now we've got a picture. So one picture is good per post. You can put more if you'd like, but be aware that the more pictures you put, the slower your site will be, because all of these pictures have to download. And if you didn't take the time to compress your picture before you upload it, which is out of the scope of what I can talk about, if you didn't shrink your picture in Photoshop or, or picture, or what's it called, photos on the Mac, if you, didn't, if you didn't shrink your picture beforehand, if you're putting it straight from your digital camera, that 20 megapixel image and seven more that you've got on screen are going to take forever to download and then it, you're going to have unhappy customers, unhappy readers, because your pictures are going to, you're going to see them loading line by line by line by line, seven of them. So you're going to need to deal with shrinking the pictures and so forth, add the picture, add the alt text. Is, is it's related. Shrinking is that it keeps, for example, this whole picture here, right? Cropping would be that I only keep the eyes. Right? I cut out the rest, like with scissors, and I only keep the eyes. That's cropping. Shrinking is that I keep the whole thing, but I just shrink it down to that size. So why does Ben have those little boxes? You could, boxes. You could resize and shrink and so forth. But that's still not as effective as actually doing it in a real software, because a real graphic software. Because notice as I'm making it bigger, it's getting blurry. It's losing quality. So it's because I didn't do it that way, so it was better to shrink it before you put it there? Yes. Okay. Because if you uploaded that, you know, 10 megapixel image and you shrink it here, the data is still there. It's still going to take a while to download, even though it looks smaller. It's just that WordPress shows it's smaller, but the data of the picture is still there. Okay, well, why did it have my picture to, to, um, to show up? So the thing was, the, the steps were to go to the... We're going to have our, we're gonna have our lab time in just a moment, so I'll help you at that point. At this point, we've kind of gone through all of the, all of the items here. Um, the main parts about writing, of course, we did planning before, we reiterated it. We've got the social, which we've touched on, but again, social really is a big can of worms. That's why we've got the social media class. Um, I didn't connect the, the, I didn't, on that, on the settings, remember there was um, sharing and there was publicize. If I had connected my Facebook, there would be an option somewhere over here to also share it on Facebook. I never connected it, so I don't see it. But if you had connected it, then this would automatically also get copied to your Facebook. That way you're going to be advertising this post on your Facebook to your followers. But at this point, let's say I wrote it, and I reread it, and I rewrote it, and it's ready, so I'm going to publish. On WordPress.com, it might show you you've published two posts. If it doesn't show you this, don't worry. But if you did, it might pop up here. I'm just going to go back to my site, WP Admin. And then in my post screen, it shows I published that one. And it should also show the ones from last week, but um, that, that's the big idea for today with this, with this checklist. It seems like a lot of things, but we see how we incorporated it concretely. Uh, you don't need to make sure you do all of these. You don't always have to have a list and so forth. 
uh, or external links. The more of these that you do is good, but the more that they apply and are relevant, the better. Like, it, like you don't need to force in bullet points just because I wrote here bullet points. You don't have to do the guest blogging, but it helps. You don't have to have comments. At the moment, again, comments may or may not be relevant in a few months or years. I don't know. But that was our two-day look at specifically WordPress. Day one was ideas and concepts and such. Day two and three was about using WordPress. Day four, next week, we're going to then look at the other alternative to blogging, Tumblr. WordPress is the long attention span or the long form platform. I can write 100, 200, 300 words. Tumblr is going to be much shorter. Snippets of content, snippets of text or pictures, shorter attention span, short form blog. You might get a survey of both of these and decide, okay, actually I'm going to use Tumblr more than WordPress. That's fine. Tumblr is very popular. It's got hundreds of millions of users. It's so valuable that Yahoo bought it for like ten billion dollars or something. They wanted all of those people and connections. So when we come back next time, that's what we'll look at. Creating a Tumblr account and seeing how it's different and blogging with Tumblr. Any general questions on what we looked at today? Alright, so when we come back next time, we'll look at Tumblr.